Welcome to the Leaderomic Show. I'm with Michael Kuna, CEO of Cellcom Asiata. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you so much for being here with us. You know, you, you uh, have a very interesting background. You've been in many, many places in, in many, many different uh, organizations, uh, Europe, Asia. Uh, tell us a bit of a background. Uh, just yeah, trying to find uh, things about you is not so easy to find, but tell us a bit, I mean, <laughs> tell us a little bit about you, you know, what you studied and, and, and kind yeah. of how you grew into this yeah. role of running businesses. Yeah. Very good afternoon. Thank you for having me here today in, the, in that show. Uh, happy to talk about myself a bit and about my experiences. Um, you mentioned already uh, a lot of my international exposures. So, but let's start from the very beginning. I, uh, I grew up in Germany, obviously. Uh, I'm, I'm a German by, by passport. And I always say I'm, I'm a Malaysian by choice. Okay. Because uh, that's only my passport. Uh, so, I, but I grew up in Germany. I, uh, I went to school, very traditional. Um, I, I studied uh, mathematics and economic science at some time. And, and don't what ask was me, it? Don't why? ask me anything about it because okay. I forgot everything. I, but I but was studied. there a reason why you studied mathematics, or you had to learn <clears> numbers, or? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, I think it was because I was an extremely bad student in mathematics uh, in some of the middle layer in school. Once I came up uh, higher, it. It, it sort of improved for whatever reason, don't ask me. And then at that time they opened up a, a new combination. Earlier you used to have mathematics and physics as a traditional combination. So at that time in some of the uh, universities they introduced mathematics and economics. I just, I think I found that an interesting combination, right? From the mathematics from, because I was just not so bad at that time as a student, so that was a good starting ground. And, uh, and economics was obviously something very interesting for the future. But frankly, <laughs> if you ask me now, I didn't know where I get into because mathematics is an extremely difficult uh, topic to discipline, to study, right? And, uh, and, and maybe I was not maybe the most ambitious student at that time, so it took me uh, literally eight years to finish my, my master's, which I have to say is not extraordinary, right? Yeah, yeah. Most of the students of mathematics in Germany at that time was about eight, eight years, seven years, something like that. And, uh, and uh, there is a very relevant question that you, which you have to ask yourself after you finish this, uh, this study, what are you doing? Right? You have basically not many choices. You can stay on the university, you can join an insurance and uh, get into basic uh, cal calculations for the rest of your life because they are actually uh, Yep. Obliged to have a mathematician in their in their stuff to, yeah. to sort of does all the calculation for the insurances. That was not very attractive. Lucky at that time, IT was not a known. Uh, so you can a bit guess how old I am now. It was not really a, a traditional established study already. There was no IT uh, study in the university. So most of us as mathematicians ended up in IT. And of course, we did a lot of IT throughout the. Uh, throughout the curriculum anyway. So my first job was in, uh, in Siemens, um, uh, in charge for system, system analysis uh, of one of their mainframe. Uh, all, that's all archaic stuff, right? There right, right. are no mainframes around anymore, I guess. Uh, so it's all uh, small. Uh, but, but Siemens are very, is one of the biggest brands in Germany. Uh, Siemens is, is, is obviously an electronic yeah. conglomerate, uh, uh, one of the big German companies, one of the very traditional um, German companies. I remember when I was in India it's a while ago already they had the 150th anniversary. Very established company and a good company to work. Definitely a good company for a young graduate to start um, uh, his career and a, a lot of exposure, uh, very good training, um, good uh, disciplines in terms of leadership development. So I learned obviously a lot of my So what would be one, one good lesson that you think you picked up that has helped you, you know, as you, you know, in this early, early role that you had? that has helped you over the course of your career? In the early role, and at that time, maybe I was not really, really aware of it, but I was a bit fortunate because um, I was not having a back office job. Um, after, of course, some training on the, on the system itself to understand how it works, I was uh, delegated to one of the research institutes in Germany, which were using this mainframe for their, for their research work. So I was basically on the customer side all the time, and I, my, I, I never, I never had to go to office besides doing some claims and some whatever lucky writing. You. So uh, <laughs> lucky me, and and frankly, this was maybe um, in, in, in not intended, but it 
it really um, uh, sort of uh, determined my later life because I stayed on the customer front all my career through. I was never in a, in a back office headquarter role or any of that because I think I got the grasp and the taste of it uh, being there in constant discussion. I, uh, you know, the point is if you, if you as, as a young, and you still have to learn a lot, right? It's so educating that you talk to the final end customer, you get to know their troubles, their worries, what they are concerned about. So is there anything learned at that time? It was actually how to deal with customers and how interesting it is to be in these customer-facing positions. And I kept that throughout uh, my whole career, actually. Really? So, yeah. And then, so then you moved, uh, you stu you, you moved out of Germany, or? <coughs> yeah, very early, so I, that, that role uh, kept me going for um, uh, seven, eight years, I guess. Um, and then, then that, that was a big shift at that time, because I, I somehow, um, and it was all coincidentally, you meet somebody and the guy says, hey, we actually, I, I knew him from my, from my job in, uh, in Siemens in Cologne, IT. And then he said, hey, we look for somebody in Libya. And I said, hey, that wow. sounds really adventurous. Maybe <laughs> let me travel there. So he brought me there for uh, a project, uh, in the Central Bank of Libya at that time. And wow. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was quite interesting. So, and uh, of course I traveled before, but it's different, right? Working and traveling is different. So I was there for a while and then coming back, he said, okay, that sounds like a good perspective. So let's, let's uh, go for that. And I, I signed up for it. And, uh, so you moved um, to Libya? On, 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 at the same time, I, 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 had to, I had to marry my wife because <laughs> we couldn't go <laughs> abroad without being married. So, um, so at, least that, at least that pleased her. <laughs> but then, and this is also something in my life which I learned, things never turn out as, as you plan it to be, right? So you better don't make a plan, you better look for opportunities and, and go for it. So what happened was uh, big, uh, some, some political issues in Libya, so finally Siemens decided we don't send anybody. But they said, we have a good job for you in Moscow. It's about... 40 degrees colder. <laughs> <laughs> and this was Moscow in the 70s, 80s? This was Gorbachev, yeah. Gorbachev, was okay. So there's a lot of Perestroika, Perestroika. Uh, the whole country. Also, it must be an exciting time. Complete yeah. transformation. That yep, was very yep, exciting. Yep. I mean, <clears throat> to see the transformation itself, but also to, to get to know the Russians, which are extremely uh, emotional people, uh, very warm people uh, to talk to. Yeah, that was my first uh, posting abroad. And again, um, all customer facing. And I also got the gist of the of the international exposure. So I just recognized, you know, once you really are abroad, and it's not a normal trip as you go on a, yep. on, a on a travel, you learn so much, right? You are really exposed to very uh, unusual and new situations. So you have a great, great uh, opportunity to learn uh, in in Russia. And then I moved on. Further on, so the next step was actually Libya, so it was just delayed. Maybe somebody wanted to give me a chance to learn in Russia before I move on. Uh, so my second posting was in Libya, and then we stayed in, in, in Northern Africa um, for um, 10 years about. Wow, okay. Um, Libya, Algeria, uh, as well as Tunisia for some time. Um, it was all IT, so my whole career is about IT and telecommunication actually which is a great field to be in because there is constant innovation and I've never seen any other business. And Siemens has a lot of businesses. So I, right. at some time I was in charge for the overall Siemens business in Algeria, inclusive of power stations and mm. trains and the whole you call it uh, medicine, uh, uh, medical equipment, right? So a huge uh, portfolio. Okay. But in none of these portfolios you have the speed and the dynamic than you have in telecommunication and you had at that time. And funny enough, you still have it. I yep. mean, this is Absolutely. about 30 years, 25 years later, you still have it. Yep. Yep. Things are constantly changing. And even I have the impression that the, the, the speed of change, the pace has, has actually increased towards then. Right? If you, if yep. you ask me. So Michael, we're going to take a quick break right now. Yeah. And we're going to be right back here on the Lira Armic Show. And we're going to talk more uh, with Michael on how his life has progressed and more importantly, how uh, he has made dramatic changes to take organizations to the next level. We'll be right back here on the Leader Omics Show. Welcome back to the Leader Omics Show. I'm with Michael from Cellcom and we were just talking about, I think we started in Germany and went to Moscow and, and Northern Africa and, um, and then you, trans, you, you kind of transitioned out to Asia. 
uh, or was there other roles in between? Uh, uh, no, I, I had a very short stint, you know, um, as, a, as, a, as a professional traveling the world. And sometimes people tell you you are not uh, sociable in your home country anymore. <laughs> and I took that very serious. So I thought uh, at some point after 10 years in, in Northern Africa, I said, okay, let's make a test whether I can work in Germany still and whether I'm still sociable. So we transferred back to Germany for, uh, for a role in Germany. But, and it was very interesting. Um, it was in the northern region. Again, a sales role um, um, in the area of private exchange, uh, corporate customers, uh, big, big business houses where my customer them. And it worked. It worked fine. So I was successful. Um, I could adapt to the German pace, and I was <laughs> accepted in the business community. German pace relative to the African pace. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which is a which, which is a little bit faster. <laughs> but uh, but uh, but frankly, it was not so much fun as I thought, but, uh, because um, uh, maybe I take it from the positive side. Uh, why did I want to move to Asia? Which which it again was a coincidence. I think if anything I, I learned in my life is that you really have to be very open for coincidences happening. I, I know that there are a lot of discussion if you talk about leadership development or plan, then you identify gaps and, and all of this and you have to have a goal in life and I think it's all true. But I think it can also actually um, take you away from what, you, what opportunities you really have because you get just sidelined yeah. on, uh, on your own views. Yeah. So what happened, um, just, to, just to make that point, um, I was up to follow a leadership uh, training um, in leadership program from Siemens, which was uh, in, uh, done by the Duke University, uh, and it was clustered in regions, because Siemens is a worldwide company, obviously, so they had the cluster Asia, they had a cluster US, a cluster Europe, and so on and so on. So when they, when they sort of offered me the opportunity to join that program, which I was very happy of, they said, but there is a bit of a problem because the European class is full. But would you, have, uh, uh, would you have actually interest to join the Asian class? I said, well, why not? That sounds really interesting, <laughs> right? So I, I joined the, this uh, three-part training. Uh, first part was in Singapore, second part Malaysia, third part Singapore again. So that's why the first time I came to Malaysia, actually. And funny enough, I fell immediately in love with the country. Right? It was one of these countries where you come, you touch down, you get out of the airplane and, and whatever you see yep. in the last, I, mean, I see, I saw, actually I saw a lot of classroom in the last, <laughs> in the next three days because it was all training, a very tough uh, charge program. But of course we were able to go out a bit and uh, I still remember we had a half a day off and uh, three of us said, okay, let's get a car somewhere and we could go to these Batu caves, which we yep. heard about, yep. right? At that time, so we took a taxi from the road and went to the Batu caves and Cl of hours. Climbed up all that 200. Yes, of course, <laughs> of course. Uh, yeah, we, we needed some exercise, physical yeah. exercise after, after all, all the, the classroom sessions. Classroom. Well, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and, and a lot of food they served. So it was very good uh, to balance this. So, yeah, so I, I was here, I liked it. And when I came back, I still remember I said to my wife, you know what? We go to Malaysia. And as it happened, maybe the power of thought, right? Uh, I talked to an earlier colleague, Siemens in Munich, which I knew from Africa. He was heading the uh, communication, telecommunication part. And he said, you know, uh, you know, are you looking for opportunities? And I said, yeah, always. <laughs> so then he said, you know, the current head, uh, country head in Malaysia, I, I actually want him to go to the US. Would you be interested? And, and I didn't even ask for Malaysia. You know, that was like coming on to me. Uh, fantastic. So I said, yeah, absolutely. And then it took, of course, a couple of weeks and uh, another visit to see if we really like it here. And we did, so that, that brought me to Malaysia. Um, seeing it now, uh, if you ask me about uh, working environments uh, for a professional and comparing, of course, uh, Africa, I'll leave out Russia for a moment because that was a short time, but Africa, uh, Northern Africa, I have to say, Europe and, and Malaysia, and, and then by now, because I was in other countries, I think I can talk for the whole of Asia. It's just uh, tremendously more uh, exciting to work here because uh, there's much more vibrancy, much more dynamic, much more passion, much more ambition than you would ever face. So I think somebody who has worked here, that's a bit of a problem to go then back to Europe because you would possibly get completely um, 
impatiently annoyed yeah. by by readapting to the speed right. normally things have in this do, part of the do, world. Do you think that is a, a factor of the fact that many of these countries are developed countries? So when you are a developed country, you don't really have a goal. Yeah versus a developing country who has, still has a goal and still yes. has ambition. I mean, do, does that drive well, there, them? There are a couple of, yeah, this is definitely the case, but there is another one which is extremely important. If you look into the age structure or the demographic of these countries, these countries tend to be heavy on the yeah. above oh, 40 course. side, right? Okay. Whereas countries in Asia and Malaysia is not as extreme as Bangladesh. In Bangladesh, you have about, I think, 75 or 80 percent of people below 30, right? So it's actually a completely young a population. Young country, so yeah. the pyramid is, is about that. Uh, in, in, in Europe, it's, it's about yeah. this pyramid, if at all, right? So it's sometimes it's, it's, mm. it's, it's, sometimes it's, inverse it's, it's yeah. actually inverse, right? So, yeah. um, so this, is, this is a big factor. So it's, it is a development. It's a growth, which is still there, which you don't have in these uh, developed countries. It's the young population. And, and I think it's also somehow you, different cultures have different uh, attributes. Yeah. Uh, it's, I think it's also a little bit in the, in the culture, maybe DNA of people in, in that part of the world to be quicker, behave different, be more uh, situational, right? I think one thing that was always struck me, struck me from the very beginning in Malaysia and, and that continued definitely in, in Bangladesh uh, as well as India later on is that capability to get things together on a, on a very short notice, right? So we call that that last minute syndrome which can be annoying sometimes uh, if you want to plan something ahead, right? So especially, I had to... Especially for I, Germans, I guess. Exactly. <laughs> so I had to tweak my German, you know, planning capabilities a bit and get the trust that uh, this will also work out and, and um, how did you on an, in another way, which it did. Right. So you were, you were still with well. Siemens in Malaysia? Yeah. And then you transitioned to Bangladesh to... Uh, no, uh, from... Uh, from, uh, from uh, I, I stayed actually on to Siemens um, uh, uh, until 2009, and I, 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 changed, I moved for Siemens, uh, all in telecommunication to India, then to Japan and Korea, then back to India, uh, because there was a merger in between. Uh, and then from India, I changed company. I joined Asiata in 2009 and moved to Bangladesh to and run we'll their, their, their asset in Bangladesh. Okay. So we'll be right back again. Mm. We'll take mm. another quick break, and we'll be right back on the third segment of the Lira on Mix show shortly. Welcome back to the Leonomics Show. I'm here with Michael, the CEO of Salka Masiata. You know, we were talking about your leadership journey. And, you know, being in Asia, you know, Japan and India and Bangladesh, Malaysia and Singapore and all these countries, right? Is there a secret that you, f you could share, you know, maybe a nugget of wisdom that you think leaders should uh, listen to? Any advice you would give uh, to be a successful leader, you know, especially if you're not, a, you know, in a, a local in that country? Yeah, I think uh, there's definitely no secret because uh, many more people than myself have gone through similar journeys and have written a lot of books about it. I've not written a book yeah, and so I'm maybe planning a book. So, Very good. Uh, but uh, but uh, of course, there are a couple of things. First of all, I think um, if you talk about these countries that you mentioned, Japan, Korea, Bangladesh, uh, Malaysia. Uh, India, even Malaysia, um, they are so different, right? They are extremely, from the outside, sometimes it looks like it is a bit similar, um, but if you live there and, and more if you work there, you recognize that uh, there is a lot of differences. So if anything you, as, as a, a growing leader, especially when you want to be internationally exposed and in different countries, you have to really create and, and grow your sensitivity towards uh, the local culture, right? And, and it, to make some points, if you, if you take Bangladesh as, a, as an example, <clears throat> it really stands out because the people there are extremely warm and passionate about things they are doing, right? but also very easily, easily offended. Right? And, 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 but you can get the best out of them. They go the extra mile if you really convince them and, they, and you gain their heart, you can do, get them. you gain any war and any business battle you want to you win. Right? Mm. In India, <clears throat> It's all about scale. I mean, India is, uh, I, one thing I learned in India is actually scale because everything you do 
it's just multiplied by the thousands or, or oh, millions, millions yeah. if, if it'd be in the first case, right? <laughs> you roll out thousands of base stations every month where some countries, they would say, oh my God, this is not possible. What you do with the country is just, it's just huge. So everything is very big. And, and, and uh, uh, on the positive side, again, the, the people in India are extremely knowledgeable, knowledgeable extremely um, ambitious on what they want to do. And I, I think what I learned there is two things um, from them is really how to run a cost efficient organization because that's where they're really good in and they have to be because yeah, prices yeah. are, as we know, extremely low and you have to gain it from the scale of the business. And the second one they are really good in uh, and I think we all can learn from them is, is to be to have that never give up attitude. I've never seen anybody in this country giving up anything. Right? They're just Push. Keep going. They just keep going. Right? That's extremely impressive. Hmm. And then you come to Japan, which is sort of like uh, so. I did that time. Tra I, I call it a time travel from from India to Japan and then back to India, right? So it was like uh, going from one world to the other because on the on the on the Japanese side, it's all about quality, uh, discipline, punctuality. Um, a little bit more and German. I have to say, a little bit more German. Yeah, I, I knew you were saying that. I knew it. But I always say, actually, that's not really true because the Japanese are much better than the German. <laughs> we are only a, a weak offspring of that quality. <laughs> but they learned uh, it from the Germans. So I, I'm not sure. No, they are maybe, maybe the older culture. So don't get into true, true, very true. difficult territory. Yeah, maybe we won't go there. <laughs> not, not a good, not a good comparison. But it's actually extremely interesting to learn. Um, I think the point is they have quality as as something essential to everything they do. Right? It's, it's actually an obsession. They're obsessed about quality. If you build a network there, you cannot allow any out time at any point in time, which is extremely costly because you build a network with all double ups and triple ups and quadruple ups so that one thing fails, the other backup can, can skip yeah. in. It's extremely costly, right? So prices obviously are uh, much higher there for communication than they would be in, in Malaysia or the rest of Asia. But uh, Japanese people obviously yeah. expect that, accept it and, and pay for it uh, at the same time and they do it uh, all along. So you can, you can learn how an obsession to one specific point is actually giving you quite a differentiation uh, yeah, not only in your market, but uh, as, as a culture and as a country overall. Right? Okay. So I think uh, learning is that when you run a company, you have really to be very clear on what is your key um, differentiator. differentiator mm -hmm. right? what do, where do you want to thrive on? Uh, and of course, you have to be good in many things and you cannot be only good in one, but, but there's one thing maybe which you, which you would really like to have on, on top of your mind all the time and ask always a question, this specific one uh, is, uh, w what is it contributing to that specific uh, differentiator? And uh, I've learned also um, um, in, um, in, in different organizations, it may be different things, it may be uh, cost efficiency, so it may be price, it may be innovation, so many companies run on innovation. Um, um, at the moment in Cellcom we are clearly focused on customer experience, uh, and are extremely customer centric. So if there's anything we've done in the last seven months is trying to turn everybody's face in the company towards the market mm -hmm. and uh, to learn be from end. our customers what, what they want. So we send out troops uh, to market visits. We listen to customers in the call center as a overall, uh, the whole team, uh, and that goes down mm. to any level. I, I think that's very so, critical. So to be, this is extremely critical. To, to really know what the customer wants and, and deliver that, that kind of uh, yeah. service. And, and I think um, and that's one of the learnings in Japan, because besides uh, being very quality focused, they are extremely customer focused as well, which is, makes it extremely difficult for a foreign company to go into this market, because believe it or not, I mean, after I worked there, I can say that, there is hardly any foreign company which really understands the customer focus of a Japanese company. Mm -hmm. they, they, they just mess up at mm -hmm. some time. And <clears throat> hopefully you have a local setup, like we have been at that time for Nokia, because then there was a merger with Nokia uh, and Siemens. So as a local setup, you have to ensure that your headquarters somehow understands that this is different, that this is not the world you know, and forget about being um, uh, 
being not very focused on it because you will just fail. Mm. And, uh, and the good thing in, in the Japanese business is when you have built up a relationship <clears throat> and you have gained the trust, you have a relationship forever, very difficult to hurt it. But of course you must play the game and, okay. and deliver the quality and, and the customer focus they expect. And speaking about playing the game, we have to okay. subject you hey, to the Thinkonomic Challenge. So we have a game and the Thinkonomic Challenge is very simple. You have a, a minute to, uh, I'll start it soon. But we'll have a minute to answer a number of questions. Hey, I'm just going to randomly. That's a long time. Yeah, but you've got to answer. such a long time? So in Asia, all is short time. Yeah, but you've a minute to answer as many questions as possible. Oh, as right? many as possible. So we'll see how many we can okay. get We get through. So I'll, right. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll run through a few and then shoot, shoot the answers, all right? Okay, here we go. First question, which is more important? important to you when you when you're following a leader results or inspiration uh, results results okay would you enjoy spending a month of solitude in a beautiful natural setting where there's only you alone i would love it you would love it <laughs> why <laughs> you know i think it, it is it is very nice and good to maybe you would stop the watch no, okay, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> we'll do that we'll do that <laughs> go ahead go ahead no, you know <laughs> and i think maybe a bit uh, Contraintuitive, but uh, I think um, as a leader, you, 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 it's good you are able to, to basically enjoy both worlds, right? The very busy, hectic world of constant communication, constant happening, constant action. And I, and I do, I really enjoy it, and it, 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 mm. it gets me going and driving. But on the other side, at some time, you have to contemplate, you have to think about Correct. things, you have to Absolutely. find out whether you are on the right track or there's anything you can do differently. And frankly, I have the best ideas if I have this, it's not solid. actually a month, but these minutes of solitude or maybe uh, hours of solitude yeah. where I can um, refresh my brain and get other ideas. I, I think all great leaders you know, have to spend some time in solitude to really <coughs> refine. I mean, Absolutely. that's why prison has been such a... Uh, <laughs> many leaders get inspired after they go there. Okay, we'll, okay, we'll continue. So that's something you can maybe include in the, <laughs> yeah, it's part of the leadership, leadership, leadership curriculum. Leadership a couple of months prison. in prison. Exactly. <laughs> solitude. Yes. All right. So if my motives are wrong, should I stop giving? If my motives are, are wrong, wrong, should, should I, I stop, stop giving? Giving. Um, yeah, I think you should stop giving because it is about the motive more than the action itself. Yeah. All right, next one. Which would you prefer, to be in control or let others take control? Oh, different <laughs> one. Um, that's a bit in between uh, because I believe strongly in empowerment as a leadership quality. So I am happy to have others in control, but obviously only under the assumption that they are accountable and can take up the control. Mm. And I think there are different situations that will, will, will yes. require different. Okay, sure, yeah. maybe we can get one more question. What is the most important ingredient for you to establish a strong, strong relationship? What's the most important mm -hmm. ingredient to establish a strong relationship? Uh, trust. trust, obviously trust. Yeah. Okay, and, and how does that play out? I mean, you're in the front line a lot, right? Um, trust is such an important thing yeah. in the front line, right? How does one develop that, you know, especially in business? Hmm. Um, I think... And, and this is not only a, a capability that you, you should have as a leader towards the outside world. Same goes with your employees and your partners all around through 360. I think you need to be very transparent, very open, very fair, impartial in what mm. you are doing. You need to give respect and you need to be reliable. And uh, the best trusted relationships I've built up with customers where we really had an extremely <clears throat> difficult situation or a crisis for that matter where we were not in good shape as a company, as a vendor, right? But going through that crisis in a transparent manner and really showing best efforts and capability and finally, of course, uh, solving it has built that trust mm. that you need to, yep. to go through. So it's really about honesty and yes. transparency. So I'm going to end with one, one, two questions. You know, if you were, if I'm a fresh grad, I come out yeah. from university and I want to be just like you, you know, I want to go around the world, succeed, run businesses and, you know, work in Malaysia maybe. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, what sort of advice would you, would you give to a young fresh grad that's just coming out, you know, into the world and... I think, um, and, and that's maybe a bit different from where I started. Nowadays, I think the first advice I would give uh, is to become really specialist in one or two fields, right? And, uh, and nowadays, ideally in the area of artificial intelligence, uh, UI, UX, or, or, or data analysis, or any of these fields which will clearly play. So you need to be specialist in one or better even two of those fields before you start you know, engaging to grow and so on and so on. Uh, then the second advice, uh, whenever that's a bit driven by my own experience, uh, whenever you start uh, 
going out of a university, start a job, go on the customer front. So start dealing with customers uh, very early. Um, don't don't start you know being in the back office and doing analysis and and, and, and doing PowerPoint <laughs> shows or any of that. Uh, it doesn't help you a lot in the development perspective because you don't learn so much. Right? As I said earlier, you learn really with the customer. So go in a customer fronting position and stay there for, for a long time. Okay. Uh, and then, uh, of course, be, be you know, ex explorative, adventurous, uh, curious about anything which comes across and, and grow yourself with the uh, experiences. The last one, which is also more important nowadays than it was earlier, is network, 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 because Everything nowadays, uh, and I don't talk about telecom networks, I talk about personal <laughs> networks, right? It's so important to be connected uh, for two reasons. First of all, because you are visible and, and you get across opportunities easier. But also from a, from a perspective of learning, right? You only learn if you are networked, uh, not necessarily by reading books, but by talking to people and tapping their experience. Absolutely. Michael, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for being here on the show. We've been speaking to Michael Kuhner here on the Leader on the Mix show.